Oh, look at this. Look how cute he is. Infancy narratives. What are they and why are they worth digging into? For Christians, I'd say they're worth digging into in order to understand the earliest traditions and beliefs the first participants of the faith held during their lifetimes. For non-Christians, I'd say they're worth digging into because it brings to light important information about why each of the Gospels were written in the first place and what their purpose actually was, not just what the church has been telling its congregants their purpose was over the last 100 years or so. I'm not making this video to persuade anyone to believe what I and the other scholars I learned from are saying. I'm making this video to encourage you to do this research for yourself and see what kind of sense it makes to you. As the chosen four out of many Gospels in existence at the time of the canonization of the New Testament, it's important to read these four as they were intended, separate documents written for their time and place in order to record that local community's oral traditions about Jesus Christ. None of the authors knew each other. None of the authors were eyewitnesses to Jesus' life and ministry, and absolutely all four of them were written anonymously. If that makes you uncomfortable to hear, I encourage you to stick it out and try to remain open to learning new information that's been withheld from you in traditional Christian church services. In this series, we're going to be covering the infancy narratives, or lack thereof, of the four Gospels of the New Testament in the order in which they were written. But you might be asking, Andy, how can a lack of infancy narrative in Mark teach us anything about the birth of Jesus Christ? That's exactly what we'll be exploring today on the first episode of Deconstructing Christmas. Hi, I'm Andy, and my pronouns are they, them. This is Assigned Christian at Birth, a YouTube-based collection of resources for people who are deconstructing, questioning, or curious what their ex-evangelical family members may believe. Welcome to Deconstructing Christmas, a series that's been produced to shed light on the different narrative traditions regarding the conception of Jesus and what these differences can teach us about both historical Jesus and also some of the theologies and Christologies of the earliest Christians who were living 40 to 70 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. This series may bring to light some uncomfortable premises that don't jive with what you've been taught in the Christian church growing up. You may not believe what I'm saying, and that's okay. In fact, I highly encourage you to go study early church history and decide for yourself if what you've been fed at your modern day church your whole life is correct. Happy holidays all, let's get into it. So obviously we all know that the four gospels found in the canon of the Christian New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. However, this series is going to cover them in the order that they were written. Mark first, written around 70 CE, Matthew and Luke next, written around the 80s CE, and then John written around 100 CE. Each gospel has its own theme. In Mark, the theme is Jesus the suffering son of God, Matthew, Jesus the Jewish Messiah, Luke, Jesus the savior of the world, and John, Jesus the man sent from heaven. These descriptions are found in Bart Ehrman's book, Jesus Before the Gospels, and I highly recommend it. All four of these gospels were written in the Greek language by authors living outside of Palestine in the Jewish diaspora during and following the first Jewish Roman war and destruction of the temple. What I mean by Jewish diaspora is that after all the Jewish people were driven out of Rome, they were living in different places and Greek speaking areas within small enclaves of Jewish people, any group of people living together in community outside of their homeland is diaspora. And once again, one of the main things we need to remember about these Gospels is that just because they're titled the Gospel according to Mark, the Gospel according to Matthew, etc., these were anonymously written Gospels. Those titles were attributed to them much later when the Gospels were being copied and recopied by scribes, and then even later on once the canonization of the New Testament occurred. If you've made it this far, if you could do me a great huge favor by smashing that like button, I would greatly appreciate it. Gospels and Christologies. What are Gospels and Christologies? According to Joseph F. Kelly, who wrote The Birth of Jesus According to the Gospels, rather than biographies, Gospels are theological accounts of Jesus' public career. The evangelists, Gospel writers, wrote as believing Christians for other believing Christians, not as secular historians writing for a general audience. To use a technical term, each evangelist produced a Christology, that is, a theology of Christ. Let's dig a little deeper into the definition of Christology. Kelly explains that it's a text that tries to show that the mystery of Christ, comprehensible only by faith, can be truly if incompletely understood by the believer. The evangelists pass along their faith in Jesus as the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world, the Messiah, the firstborn of the new creation, and the founder and foundation of the Christian faith. These authors wrote the Gospels in order to write about the risen Christ, the basis of their faith. But first they had to give an account of what his life was like here on earth 
before the resurrection. Kelly writes that modern historians strive for objectivity, but ancient writers did not. Instead, most wrote to push a political or patriotic point, such as showing the greatness of their peoples. So it's easy to understand that each of the gospel writers from their own small communities had their own oral traditions about the life of Jesus. Some stories matched up with those from other communities and others did not. Each gospel writer had their own reason and agenda for writing them. Kelly writes that we must understand even more about ancient historians. They were allowed to put speeches in the mouths of their characters in order to move the narrative along, something which would destroy the reputation of a modern historian. In order to illustrate this, Kelly gives the example of the Roman historian Tacitus, who lived from 57 to 117 CE. When Tacitus wrote about the conquest of Britain, he crafted an eloquent speech by a British tribal leader rallying his troops. But Tacitus himself was never in Britain or even knew their language. He simply wrote a speech of encouragement that a leader would give to his men. This concept, when applied to the Bible, makes so much sense. When we know that the Gospels are written anonymously, how does this anonymous person living in the Jewish diaspora know all of these sayings of Jesus exactly as he said them? He doesn't. He has the idea of what Jesus taught based on the oral traditions of his community, but the way that Jesus' sayings are written in each of the books are up to the author. A little intro to Mark. Christianity had expanded from the Near East to the wider Roman Mediterranean world and the Jewish diaspora. Many diasporan Jewish people were living in Greek-speaking countries, hence the writing of the canonical gospels in the Greek language. Why is this worth pointing out? Jesus himself spoke Aramaic. None of the words the authors wrote down ever came directly from Jesus' mouth. They wrote in Greek. I'm still going to keep referring to the author as Mark, as most people do, because that's now what is on the gospel in the Bible. But please know, every time I say Mark, I do mean anonymous, who has been called Mark. How do we know that the book of Mark came first? There have been many theories and hundreds of years of study when it comes to the New Testament and in what order the Gospels were written. For the sake of time, we'll explore one of the reasons scholars are comfortable asserting that Mark was written first. Again, there are many, many different reasons. This is just one of them, and I'm hoping it's enough to whet your appetite to cause you to research this yourself some more. In Kelly's book, he walks the reader through an experiment to demonstrate how Matthew, for example, could not possibly have been written before Mark, because if he had written it before Mark, then Mark would have left out a lot of details found in Matthew's text. Mark's gospel has no infancy narrative, does not include the Lord's Prayer, the eight Beatitudes, major parables, and Jesus's post-resurrection appearances. Kelly suggests that if one or two of these were missing, it might make sense, but there's no way Mark would have purposefully left all of these important pieces of the Jesus story out. He then points out that whenever Mark does include material that can also be found in Matthew, there are problems. Like in Mark 1.13, where it says Satan tempted Jesus. When Matthew 4, 1 through 11 tells this story, he includes a full dialogue between Jesus and Satan. If Mark wrote second, why would he leave that out? Mark's writing style is also much more clumsy and clunky than Matthew's, such as in Mark 4, 35 through 39, when Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves. In Mark's telling, he has Jesus wake up twice, the second time after which the disciples have already been in conversation with him. Mark also mentions other boats being there, but then he never goes back to write about what happened to those other boats during the storm. Conversely, in Matthew 8, 23 through 27, there is no mention of other boats and Jesus only wakes up once. Kelly asks us to think about what makes more sense. One, that Mark took Matthew's account and added confusing details, or two, that Matthew was using Mark's account and removed the confusing details. In his book, Jesus Before the Gospels, Bart Ehrman writes that in summing up this assessment of what we now know from such anthropological studies, I think it is fair to say that people in oral cultures do not preserve their traditions intact with verbatim accuracy from one telling to the next. They not only do not do so, they also do not care to do so. Storytellers in oral cultures tell their tales to communicate with their audiences in very specific contexts. Both the audience and the context will affect how the story is told, expansively or briefly, which entire episodes will be added or deleted, which details will be changed, expanded, or passed over completely. Someone who then hears that version of the story you're teaching will later tell her own version. Whoever hears that version will tell his own version, and on it goes until someone writes it down. So basically, each one of the authors of the Gospels had their own traditions, stories, and beliefs based on verbal retellings within their own diverse communities. If you were raised in fundamentalism like I was, you likely heard that all of the stories of Jesus stayed perfectly preserved because oral tradition mandated that the tellers keep every detail intact. What's wild is that this is not true at all. And what's even wilder is how many people don't know that this is the case. 
Kelly tells us that for many ancient people, the advantage of oral tradition was that a saying or event could be modified to suit an audience, which is something that even modern Christians do. Ehrman says traditions experience massive changes, not simply because people have bad memories. That may be true as well, but even more important, when people pass along testimonies about the past, they are telling the stories for a particular reason to a particular audience, and the amount of interest the teller can arouse in his audience largely depends on the way he tells the story and on the the individual twist he gives it. As a result, the tradition inevitably becomes distorted. An interesting literary choice that the author of Mark makes is that his gospel complements the beginning of Genesis 1. Mark 1 1 says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we all know Genesis 1 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The ancient Israelites didn't write an origin story for God, but a description of his creative work. And Kelly says that similarly, Mark feels no no need to try and prove Jesus' existence with a biography of his beginnings. As the first canonical gospel written, this shows us that at the time of Mark's writing, the oral traditions about Jesus and his region and his language did not include an infancy narrative. Even better, it shows us that sometime between the year 70 CE, when Mark was written, and when Luke and Matthew were written in the 80s, there arose a need to add Jesus' birth to Mark's gospel narrative. Now we're going to talk about the theme of Mark, which is Jesus as the suffering Messiah. The first verse of Mark says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word gospel comes from the Greek word euangelion, which means good news. It was a word used to describe magnificent events like triumphant military conquests or benefactions from an emperor to his people. So what is this great news? That Jesus is going to be tortured and killed? Mark has a lot of theological work to do in order to convince people that this was a good thing. The term Christ is a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, which merely means anointed one. Christians of today are well accustomed to thinking of Jesus as the formerly predicted Messiah. However, in the Jewish world of Jesus' day, that's not a view that anyone had ever held, past or present. Everyone reading Mark knew who Jesus was, an apocalyptic preacher from small town Galilee who had just been crucified as a criminal 40 years earlier. Yet Mark begins by announcing that Jesus was the Messiah. The title announces the theology that will be interwoven throughout this text. Mark is about to explain how a crucified criminal was actually the Son of God. In the absence of an infancy narrative, Mark starts his text by listing out the credentials of the Messiah that Jesus held. Mark's account of Jesus starts with a series of episodes designed to show that Jesus had the credentials of the Messiah, stories of different healings and miracles. He introduces John the Baptist as the forerunner of the one who is greater, Jesus. Following Jesus' baptism, he spends 40 days in the desert being tempted by Satan before returning to Galilee to preach a message that was very similar to John's, while casting out a demon, healing a sick mother law and curing a man with leprosy. Ehrman has a lot to say about this. Mark begins his narrative by announcing that this Jesus was the Messiah, and somehow his public humiliation and destruction was a good thing, the good news. In a sense, that is what his title announces he is about to do. He is about to explain how it is that a crucified criminal was in fact the anointed one of God. In doing so, Mark is most likely not simply recording his own personal memory of Jesus. He was not a disciple or eyewitness to Jesus' life. Instead, he was narrating a memory of the Christian community in which he lived and possibly had been raised wherever it was located some 40 years after Jesus' death. He goes on to say, The future king has to be rejected and killed before he can return to wreak vengeance on his enemies. Why should anyone see Jesus as that future king? Mark shows why in his opening stories. Not only does he himself declare that Jesus is the anointed one in the title of his book, and not only does God declare it at his baptism, but also Jesus himself begins his public ministry by showing all who can see that he is the authoritative leader God has chosen for his people. The Joseph Conundrum Mark never mentions Joseph by name. He uses the term son of Mary to refer to Jesus in Mark 6, 3. Matthew and Luke have the citizens of Nazareth speak of Jesus as the son of the carpenter and the son of Joseph in Matthew 13, 55 and Luke 4, 22. Brown presents the idea that the silence regarding Joseph when it comes to Mark is on purpose because Mark knew Jesus had no father. Another scholarly theory is that Joseph died before Jesus began his ministry because Joseph never shows up during Jesus's ministry in any gospel. There's no way we can know based on Mark whether the most ancient oral tradition called Jesus the son of Mary, the son of Joseph, or the son of Mary and Joseph, but what Mark does show us is that the phrase the son of Mary is at least one ancient Christian memory of the scene. 
Mark 6, 3 is the only scene in the New Testament where Jesus is identified by his relationship to his mother. Now we need to talk about a little something called the Proto-Gospel of James. The Proto-Evangelium Jacobi, or the Proto-Gospel of James, is the most popular gospel outside of the canonical four in the Christian New Testament. It's called the Proto-Gospel because it's about things that happened before Jesus was born, namely things that happened to Mary and Joseph. The book claims to be written by one of Joseph's sons from previous marriage named James, but the reality is that the book was written long after James died, somewhere in the second century CE. The general gist of this gospel is that Mary was born to a barren woman in a miraculous birth, not unlike John the Baptist or Abraham's son Isaac in the Tanakh. It tells how she was raised in the Jewish temple and fed daily by an angel before becoming engaged to Joseph, a man very much her senior. There's nothing about Joseph's age in the canonical gospels, but the reason I'm pointing out his grandpa status in this proto-gospel is is because that it was this very text that inspired the Middle Ages Christian art, storytelling, and memories. All those paintings of Joseph as an old fogey with a beard and Mary as a young girl, taken from the Proto-Gospel of James. The tradition that Mary rode to Bethlehem on a donkey, taken from the Proto-Gospel of James. Neither of these things show up in Mark or the other synoptic gospels, but they are traditions or memories taken as fact in today's understanding of the Christmas story. The gospel is a midrash, which is an elaboration on the birth narratives found in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, and many of its elements, notably its very physical description of Mary's pregnancy and the examination of her hymen by the midwife Salome, strongly suggests that it was attempting to deny the argument of Docetus, Christians who held that Jesus was entirely supernatural. Joseph is understood to be Mary's guardian while she's working at the temple, and at that time there is no romantic relationship between them. He continues to be her guardian when she immaculately conceives, and in fact, his sons keep watch outside the cave where she gives birth to Jesus. Before we continue talking about Jesus, we've got to cover the Paul of it all. Paul wrote before any of the gospel authors, and it's wild to interrogate just how little he wrote about Jesus's life before he died. When you grow up the way I did in evangelical fundamentalism, when the gospels come first and then Paul's writings, it's very easy to just go with what everyone else believes that this is the order in which things were written. However, we have proof that Paul wrote his letter before the gospel authors wrote their gospels. There are a total of 13 letters in the New Testament that claim to be written by Paul. However, scholars are widely convinced that only seven of them actually belong to him. There are myriad debates about the authorship of the other six, but Ehrman points out that if you go through all 13 that claim to be Pauline in authorship, there are very few stories of Jesus within them. Even though Paul is our single link to eyewitness reports, he does not give us much information about Jesus. In Galatians 1, 18 through 20, he says he met two apostles, and in Galatians 2, 9, he says he met with the disciple John. So if he had actually been able to meet these eyewitnesses, why didn't he write much about Jesus? Let's take a look at the right-hand side first. What Paul, parentheses, pre-Mark, remember, he was writing this before the Gospel of Mark was written. What Paul says about Jesus, he was born of a woman, he was born a Jew, he was descended from the line of King David, he had brothers, one was named James, he had 12 disciples, he conducted his ministry among Jews, he had a last meal with his disciples the night before he was arrested, he knows two specific things Jesus said at that last supper, he knows Jesus taught not to get divorced, he knows Jesus taught that they should pay their preacher. In 1 Timothy, which was probably not actually written by Paul, it says Jesus appeared before Pontius Pilate. Paul also writes that Jesus died of crucifixion, and that those responsible for his death were Judeans. Now, the list on the left is not a full list by any means. You would have to look at all the Gospels and compare them to Paul's writing, and basically anything other than the list I just read, Paul didn't say about Jesus. But here are some big facts, shall we say, about Jesus from the Gospels which were written after Paul that Paul did not write about at all. Jesus being born in Bethlehem, Jesus being born to a virgin, Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist, tempted in the wilderness, preaching the coming kingdom of God, telling parables, casting out demons, doing miracles of any kind, delivering any other teachings of any kind, having controversy with Jewish teachers, being transfigured, traveling to Jerusalem during the last week of his life, making the triumphal entry, cleansing the temple, being arrested in Gethsemane, and more. And you have to wonder why the first person who did any Christian writing 
Keating, who was also the person who had contact with three eyewitnesses to Jesus's life and ministry, only wrote these few things down about Jesus. Wild to think about. So here we come to the crux of it all. Why is there no infancy gospel in Mark and why are there infancy gospels in Matthew and Luke? Each gospel writer established their own Christology via the theology of their gospels, and the authors of both Matthew and Luke were clearly uncomfortable with Mark's portrayal of Jesus and his Christology, especially how Mark establishes Jesus's divine sonship. Mark 1, 10 through 11a says, And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, with thee I am well pleased. To modern Christians who know all four Gospels and who consider John the Baptist as a forerunner of Jesus, this passage presents no problems. But look at it in mid-first century terms when Mark's was still the only written Gospel. Mark says that God recognized Jesus as his son after his baptism. First century Christians might understandably wonder if God had recognized him before that. More problematically, these Christians may have wondered if there was a causal relationship between the baptism and the recognition. These authors did not want early Christians to believe that Jesus owed his recognition as God's son to his baptism by John. It was their undertaking to demonstrate that Jesus had such recognition long before the baptism. In order to do so, they collected traditions about Jesus's birth that demonstrated that his divine recognition occurred then. They didn't include the infancy narratives in order to celebrate a feast day for Jesus's birth. They were writing the first chapters of their own Gospels and Christologies. By including the Annunciation stories, they go further demonstrate his recognition as God's son as occurring before Jesus is even born. It's because of Matthew and Luke that we know anything about the traditions covering Jesus's birth and why our knowledge of him today doesn't begin with his baptism. Through reworking Mark's gospel and adding their own community's traditions of Jesus, Matthew and Luke created their own Christologies, which we'll explore in parts two and three of this series. Each gospel writer, and don't forget there were far more than the four that made it into the New Testament canon, wrote for diverse audiences, stressing particular aspects of Jesus's person and mission. If Mark was the only gospel, we would all believe as the Christians did in Mark's day that based on this text, God recognized Jesus as his son after his baptism. The point in the end here is that Mark had no need for an infancy narrative because he and his community didn't then hold the belief that Jesus was God's son at birth. They believed he was born fully man and that God adopted him at his baptism. Matthew, Luke, and many others wrote gospels with infancy narratives in order to demonstrate that Jesus was God's son from conception, a belief that is well known to Christians of today, but not well known to the earliest Christians who only had their own community's traditions and stories of Jesus. Kelly writes that Matthew and Luke enjoyed a success that other gospel writers could not dream of. They included accounts of Jesus's birth, primarily to correct a possible misimpression from Mark's gospel that God's recognition of Jesus as his son was somehow connected or even possibly caused by his acceptance of baptism from the charismatic preacher and prophet John the Baptist. In closing, I would like to leave you with this question quote from a book called The Birth of the Messiah, a commentary on the infancy narratives in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke by Raymond E. Brown. If Mark could write a gospel and be satisfied to have the heavenly voice at the baptism make the first declaration of Jesus' identity, why did Matthew and Luke feel impelled to preface the baptism with two chapters of infancy narrative? They saw Christological implications in stories that were in circulation about Jesus' birth, or at least they saw the possibility of weaving such stories into a narrative of their own composition which could be made the vehicle of the message that Jesus was the Son of God acting for the salvation of mankind. This information gives you a lot to think about, right? Again, in the words of LeVar Burton, you don't have to take my word for it. Here's some other books that you might like, but you don't have to take my word for it. Investigate these things for yourselves. If you're interested in learning about the best place to start, let me know. I'm happy to provide resources and have conversations about these early Christian traditions. If you found this video interesting and informative, please subscribe and hit the notification bell to join us next week when we cover the infancy narrative of Matthew and learn about the author's Christology and purpose for writing his gospel. If you'd like to support me further, especially during the holidays, I have a Buy Me A Coffee, which you can find at buymeacoffee.com slash assigned X-T-I-A-N and we happily accept one-time donations as well as monthly donations for perks and benefits. Shout out to our first subscriber to the Epic Exvangelical tier who is going to get her name written in the thank you of the book I'm working on. I hope you all have a wonderful start to your holiday season and I'll see you back here next week for part two. Okay, bye!